My Sterling Single, part 36, working on the tender in the new workshop extension, removing the wheels and frames. My workshop extension is now complete, the full length worktops are in place, as are the three 1000mm base units. This is my 5 inch gauge Sterling Single and I haven't worked on it for some time. Today is the 30th of March 2022 and I should have been in the hospital having a prostate biopsy. As I mentioned in the last video, my eldest daughter and my extended family live across the road, and unfortunately she contracted COVID-19 the other day. I live in the middle of nowhere in a small village, along with my family. So I thought just in case I got COVID-19, I would cancel the biopsy. But I'm only stalling the inevitable, it's rebooked for the 19th of April. What I'm doing at the moment is showing how the frames of the locomotive and the tender are different colours. The build quality of this engine and tender is really good indeed. Either the builder was colour blind or he just got confused with the frame colours of a Great Northern Railway locomotive which is chocolate brown and another single wheeler, a Midland spinner which is painted LMS red, formerly known as Midland Red. A few viewers from time to time ask me why I don't work on more locomotives and I think this episode possibly explains that. Very similar to the full-size article, working on steam locomotives is a very labour-intensive process. What I have to do, first of all, is remove the suspension. This is not too bad. They aren't leaf springs, they're actually castings with a coil spring in the bottom. This makes things simpler. But I still have to remove six of them, which means 12 nuts and 12 spacers, before I can get the parts off. Here you can see how the dummy springs work. They look like leaf springs, but they have a coil spring in the bottom, which is a far simpler job than using proper leaf springs. Once upon a time, I had a Great Western Railway Manor class locomotive in 5 inch gauge, and that had working leaf springs, and they were very problematic. And it was only after working on these real leaf springs for quite a while before I made it so that the Manor class locomotive would actually pull some weight without slipping. It's nice to work in the new extension, complete with the central heating, it's a very pleasant space to be in, and it allows me to do two types of jobs, even though this locomotive has run in the unpainted state, and therefore is a bit dirty, it's really not that bad, I can wipe off most of the residue of oil and bits of coal and grit using a piece of kitchen roll like this, and as the extension is next to the kitchen, it's just round the corner. It immediately becomes apparent that I need two sets of tools, one for the main workshop and one for here. At the moment I'm using my trusty Barco spanner to remove the two bolts per axle box that hold the keepers in place. And as you can see, the spanner is far too big. So I need to put things like nut spinners and small spanners into some boxes that can be kept in this part of the workshop. Luckily, I have quite a few duplicate spanners and nut spinners, so this shouldn't be too difficult. I'll probably do that tomorrow. With all the keeper plates removed, I can now take the wheels off. First of all, though, I need to take the pressure off them by winding back the brake blocks as far as I can. You know what I was saying earlier about steam locomotives taking an extraordinary length of time to work on? During this episode, you will see what I mean. Here, I'm illustrating that. Even though I took the keeper plates off one side, I didn't take them off the other side. And obviously, before I can remove the wheels, not only do the axle box keepers need removing, I need to take off the brake gear as well. This job's not too bad on the tender because I can quite easily move it around on the bench, lay it on its side, turn it upside down. But if you're working on a heavy locomotive, that becomes more difficult for two reasons. The first reason being that, of course, it is heavy and difficult to move around. The second reason is damaging it. It is very easy to damage a heavy locomotive by tipping it on its side. For jobs like this, I always have some bubble wrap and plenty of it. Back to the job, and I'm trying to get the brake gear off. There was a split pin in this part which had to be removed. And after lifting the primary brake shaft, you can see that the wheels were removed and they currently sat on the track behind the tender. On most locomotives and tenders, the brake beams are like this one, flat and tapered. But that's not so with this Sterling single locomotive's tender. 
The other two brake hanger beams are just pieces of bar. And while I remember, there are washers everywhere. I don't normally like to use pliers, but I can on this job because the spacers are held onto the shafts with roll pins, and I'm supporting these bushes quite gently with the pliers because the roll pins don't allow them to rotate, and now, as you can see, it's quite straightforward, well, eventually, to remove the nuts and washers from the ends. Now the brake gear is free. Why am I going to all this trouble, you may be thinking. I could paint the frames in situ, but that's not the way to do it. Here's my box of bits containing the rest of the brake gear off the engine, as well as the Stuart Victoria pulley. I don't know where that came from. In this clip you can also see the ash pan and grate assembly. Now for the easy part, or so I thought. The frames are held to the tank just using four securing fasteners. Three simple slot headed bolts and one Allen cap head bolt. Even though I unwound the reverser so the reversing arm is free, the frame will not lift off the tank. That's because there is a drain valve right in the middle that's mounted on one of the stretchers. Here it is, and it's a tight fit. Why is it a tight fit? It doesn't need to be a tight fit. But as you can see, after a bit of juggling, I managed to lift the frame away from the tank. As this engine has been run on a track, I thought it was a good time to clean away all the rust and dirt residue from the recesses in the brass tank. I mentioned at the beginning that steam locomotives, miniature ones and even the full size, are very complicated, and so is this. Look at how much work must have been required to make this tender. When the base units and worktops were expertly fitted by a man called Steve Blissett of SB Joinery, I wanted to leave some gaps between the base units on my worktop, not for washing machines or anything like that, just for putting bits and pieces like this tender body because normally parts that are removed from engines are left on the bench, and this very quickly reduces the available workspace. When the base units were put in place, I didn't bother filling in the area between the base unit and the floor like in a kitchen, so now I can also store things underneath the base units too. That's it for this episode. In the next one, I will be removing the paint from the wheels. Stay safe, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.